Hello good people, welcome back. Today we're going to be tackling an iceberg for the very first time. And what better way to start this off than with a hotline Miami iceberg. So let's keep this simple and straightforward. If somehow you've never heard of an iceberg, an iceberg is essentially a type of meme that shares knowledge on a subject. And as you go deeper down the iceberg, the more obscure and unheard of the knowledge becomes. The iceberg has been split up into five sections, tier one, two, so on and so forth. Another thing I want to clarify before we begin, you'll find a lot of these entries are just straight up my own personal interpretations of them. This is because some of these entries are fairly obscure and I legitimately couldn't find anything on them. So my interpretation could be completely different than someone else's. Also, don't take these theories too much to heart. You'll often find that one of these theories will outright conflict with another entirely. Because at the end of the day, that's what these things are. Theories. One final disclaimer. This iceberg and I assume that you've played Hotline Miami 1 and 2 at least once, meaning you have a basic understanding of the story. I highly, highly recommend that you go play those games before watching the video. In fact, I don't think you should watch this video at all if you haven't played them, as we'll be going over some pretty heavy spoilers and I wouldn't want to be the guy to ruin the games for you. Don't worry, this video won't go anywhere, we'll play the games and come right back. Alright, let's begin. Tier 1, Jacket's real name. As the name implies, this is a theory that suggests Jacket's real name is Richard. Jacket is the main protagonist of Hotline Miami. Despite this, he was never given a proper name, so the fans gave him the name Jacket because of the iconic jersey he wears, and the name just stuck. Despite this, fans have speculated what his real name could be. The theory implies that Richard is Jacket's real name. This is because the masks seen in Hotline Miami are known to be named after their users. For example, the Jake mask being named after Jake, Richter after Richter, etc. Since we know the Richard mask was sent to Jacket, this has become the basis for the theory that Jacket's real name could be Richard. A story about how violence is bad or whatever. The story about how violence is bad is a reference to the themes and topics discussed throughout Hotline Miami 1 and 2. Despite looking like it's glorifying violence, the way we as a society treat and view violence is actually criticized in Hotline Miami's narrative. The character of Richard is often seen confronting characters on their need to be violent and hurt others. An iconic line of his is, do you like hurting other people, which has made its way into countless fan arts. The game also brings into question why we as a people are so quick to dismiss violence as it's not real if it's seen in a video game or a movie compared to a real life situation. Payday 2 Jacket is Canon Payday 2 Jacket is Canon implies that the character of Jacket in Payday 2 is real and he does exist. He isn't a figment of Wolf's imagination as some have suggested. However, it is important to know that it is heavily hinted that the Jacket we see in Payday 2 is a fan of sorts of the actual Jacket. A copycat if you will. This isn't too far fetched of an idea because Jacket had already inspired and gained a fandom by the events of Hotline Miami 2 in the early 90s. So 20 plus years later, and knowing how stories and myths grow out of hand as time passes, it isn't crazy to think that there's a guy out there that will take on the persona of Jacket, with the mask, Jacket and all. Both Hotline Miami 1 endings happened. For the life of me, I couldn't find anything related to this for some reason, but we can assume that this one is saying that both endings in Hotline Miami 1 took place. Allow me to explain. Hotline Miami 1 has two endings. The normal one, and then the secret ending that only takes place after you collect all the letters scattered throughout the game and complete the puzzle. The normal ending is basically the 250 Blessings janitors mocking Biker and not giving him any real answers. Meanwhile, the second ending has the two janitors shocked as the computer reveals to Biker their plot and their goals. Honestly, for this one, we can say that Biker had the interaction of ending 1, then after that back and forth, he had the interaction of ending 2. This is feasible because literally the only difference in the two endings is the dialogue that we see. Meaning Biker could have easily had ending 1's dialogue with the janitors and then had endings 2 confrontation happen right after. Tier 2. Henchman is a Colombian. This is a theory that argues that the henchman could be of Colombian descent, despite working for the Russian mob. This is because A. The henchman is clearly darker than the other Russians in skin tone. And B. In the phone call meant for the henchman, Sun is understood perfectly by the fans meaning he could have been speaking in English so the henchman, which, if he isn't a Russian, could understand him. It's implied that the Colombian mob had some sort of work relation with the Russian mob, but eventually they had a fallout. It's also possible that the henchman decided to simply stay loyal to the Russian mob instead of jumping ships like the other Colombians. Richard is the god of death. 
Richard is the God of Death is a theory that suggests that the character of Richard is an out-of-world divine being, a Grim Reaper type of character, Angel of Death even. This is because throughout the series he speaks to multiple characters, foreshadowing how they will go and why. For the fans he quite literally repeats word for word, verbatim, their final words ever spoken. He is also seen confronting the multiple characters on their actions and their choices. Most importantly, he advises the characters to change their ways before it's too late. Jacket through Richter the pipe in release. This is a theory that suggests that the pipe that gets thrown to Richter to defend himself in a prison fight was actually thrown by Jacket. Richter is forced to fight another prisoner who's much bigger than him, and he has no weapons. That is until someone throws him a pipe. I would love to believe this one, but something important to note is the fact that we can see who throws the pipe to Richter, and he's a generic bald prisoner. Maybe one could argue that Jacket shaved his head while imprisoned and just so happened to grow it back by the time of the ending, but that's stretching it a bit. I guess another theory, or another way to look at it, is also the fact that Release is supposed to be Richter remembering his escape from prison. So perhaps it could have been Jacket, but in his memory, in the fog of memory, he just saw him like any other prisoner. Who knows? Pardo was based on a real serial killer. Detective Manny Pardo is a homicidal, maniac attention whore who kills people to get himself on the paper. He's also a cop. Pardo was supposedly based off the real Manuel Manny Pardo Jr., who was also a former cop in Florida and eventually became a serial killer, killing 9 people in total, for which he was sentenced to death at his own request. Apparently the real life Pardo was also a Nazi sympathizer and also believed he was doing good work because all of his victims were low life drug dealers. Obviously, the Hotline Miami version drops this entire subplot, but we can definitely see that the Pardo design took inspiration from this guy. Biker survived the nuke. Biker surviving the nuke is a theory that's propelled by the fact that his death is never shown on screen, not even a single snippet of it. Jacket is a character beloved by all, and although he has no real relevance in the setting of Hotline Miami 2, he's still given time on screen to show the players him being eviscerated by the nuke. Although locations like the Bar of Broken Heroes is considered non-canon, many believe the sole purpose of that interaction was to let fans know that Biker Loki survived his meeting with Jacket. With that being said, Biker is never shown to be killed by the nuke, hence the theory of Biker surviving the nuke. Evan already knows Pardo is the Mutilator. This entry suggests that Evan might in fact know that Manny Pardo is the Miami Mutilator. Evidence for this is the fact that in Caught, Evan can be seen in the interrogation room. However, it is important to note that Cot is supposed to be the dream of a hyper-paranoid Pardo, meaning it is implied that Evan might know, never outright confirmed. One more thing to note is that when offered a ride by Pardo, Evan declines. Evan is based off of a real writer. The only thing I could find based on this one is the fact that Evan is based off of a real journalist, also named Evan Wright, who was known for his coverage on the Iraq War and an expose on a top-level CIA officer. Hotline Miami 3 Easter Egg I'm not quite sure why this one is in tier 2, the rest of them are pretty appropriate but to my knowledge this one isn't really hidden by any means, but anyways. This one is referring to the joke easter egg that is seen after the credits of Hotline Miami 2. We see a dystopian post nuclear fallout background, with buildings broken and decaying. In big neon letters we see Hotline Miami 3, then the game rewinds back to the title screen. Hard mode is Ken. Hard mode being canon is supported by the fact that when the player loads up a new game, a new cutscene plays that features Richard and the rest of the Hotline Miami 2 cast. Everyone is visibly confused and uncomfortable. As usual, Richard breaks the fourth wall and confronts the player, telling the player how they know that nothing is going to change. Nearly everyone will die again, and you know it. Yet, you're going to still play the game again and again, as if something is going to change this time. Most people who believe this theory would argue that hard mode is canon in a metaphorical sense, meaning the events of Hotline Miami 2 aren't literally being repeated over and over again, but the scene with Richard and the cast is real and it did happen, somewhere, somehow. Hotline Miami 2 is a prequel to Nuclear Throne. This theory is more of a fun joke theory, but it implies that Hotline Miami 2 is a prequel to the game Nuclear Throne. Let me explain. This theory suggests that the nuke drop in Hotline Miami 2 made all the characters into mutant creatures, the ones we see in Nuclear Throne. For example, Fish is Cory, Steroids is Mark, Chicken is Jacket, 
etc. Another cool thing to note is that Nuclear Throne is referenced in Act 1, Scene 2, Homicide, in which the characters from Nuclear Throne are seen as cardboard cutouts. The Colonel is the founder of 50 Blessings. This theory is based off the fact that throughout the second game, it is heavily implied that the Colonel, Beard Superior we see in the Hawaii missions, may have either started 50 Blessings or may have been one of the original founding members. Either way, he was part of the inception. The most obvious signs are things like the 50 Blessings symbol being shown carved into the panther's head, in which the Colonel is seen wearing a circle and three lines. Keep in mind, this is a good four years before the events of Hotline Miami 1. So it's very interesting to see the symbol way before it's ever used for 50 Blessings. Other signs that are not as obvious are things like the Colonel showing a very obvious dislike for the war. Not because he's some peace-loving activist, but because the Americans are losing. We also see the 50 Blessings operatives communicate the exact same way the military did in the Hawaii missions, using code names and doublespeak. If anyone could have started 50 Blessings, it would have been him. Tier 3. Richter was the 5th Ghost Wolf. This one theorizes that Richter might have been the 5th Ghost Wolf, meaning another member of Beard's elite group of soldiers. There's a couple of reasons for this. Firstly, A. Richter is a 50 Blessings operative. He clearly knows how to kill. It's evident just like Jacket, he must have been a veteran of the Hawaii War. B. One could also argue that the reason why Jacket spares Richter in Hotline Miami is because Richter might have fought alongside Jacket in the Hawaii War, and he realized that Richter is in the same set of circumstances as Jacket. C. In the outro of Subway, you can go upstairs into Richter's room as Evan. In there, you can find cassette tapes marked March 10th and March 16th. Now, it's never specified if these tapes are from March 1989 or 85, but if we're going off of this theory, then these tapes could easily be something related to Richter's service in the Hawaii War. March 17 is as far back as we go in the timeline, and these tapes could predate that. Last but not least, D. This is where the theory catches most of its team, and it's the fact that in the intro of Ambush, the first Hawaii level, we see a fifth sleeping bunk, but there are only four soldiers present. The colonel has his own private area, and with a bed to accommodate, of course. So who is this fifth mystery bunk for? And that is why people speculate that Richter just might have been a fifth secret ghost wolf. All VIP guards go to heaven. The only thing I can think of when it comes to this one is the VIP guard that you're forced to kill as Evan. VIP guard is the only character that you kill every single time without exception, with literally every other character being able to be spared. I believe for this reason, all VIP guards go to heaven. Homicide and Dead Ahead didn't happen and were just dreams. This theory suggests that not just Caught, but also Homicide and Dead Ahead, the other two Pardo levels, were dream levels from Pardo. Evidence for this is the fact that when we first see Pardo, he tells the waitress in the diner that he's gonna go get some sleep. Right after, he is seen going through the Homicide level. Another thing to note is the sheer amount of enemies that Pardo faces, especially in Dead Ahead, where a single man, not a vigilante with nothing to lose, but a detective is seen killing hordes of gangsters effortlessly. Sure, Pardo is a cop and he's had some basic training on how to use a firearm effectively, but he's no war vet. The cherry on top is when at the end of the missions, other cops arrive at the murder scenes. Pardo just flashes his badge and they let him walk from a seemingly fresh bloodbath. With this being said, the theory suggests that the levels are in fact just dreamt up scenarios in Pardo's mind, or, at the very least, extremely exaggerated retellings of what happened. We've established that Pardo as a character is driven by attention and glory. Him dreaming up scenarios of him slaying dozens of mobsters isn't as far-fetched as you'd think. Burn's name is a typo. The Bum is a minor character in Hotline Miami. He's often believed to be one of the few characters Jacket actually regrets killing, seen by his visible disgust as he vomits after killing him. He's also one of the few trading cards on Steam for Hotline Miami. This entry tells us that the Bum card was named Burn. This was simply due to a misread or a typo. Martin Brown is Manny Pardo from an alternate reality. This one is worded in a weird way, but I believe it refers to the theory of Martin Brown being some sort of alter ego to Manny Pardo. I know alternate reality and alter ego are two completely different things, but this is all I could find. So, this theory states that Martin Brown and the whole Midnight Animal ordeal is just another dreamt up scenario from Pardo's deranged mind. For example, Pardo is one of the ways to say Brown in Spanish. Martin Brown is, of course, Martin Brown. They both are animated in very similar ways, 
They have the same ground finisher animation and they both wield shotguns with one hand. Both have green eyes and one could even argue similar faces. Pardo dreams of fame and media coverage of the Miami Mutilator. Meanwhile, Brown is a literal movie star that has his killings recorded and glamorized, even partaking in interviews about the said murdering. Both of their final levels are about fighting through a police station and then eventually dying in that police station. This entry, as its name implies, suggests that Petrov, the guy Evan goes to meet in the first mission, is actually meant to be Erasmus from the first game. This one doesn't make too much sense to be honest. We know for the most part that Don Juan, Richard, and Rasmus in Hotline Miami are supposed to be parts of Jacket's psyche. At least that's the theory that I personally subscribe to. With that being said, Rasmus is meant to be a physical manifestation of the mob that Jacket kills throughout the game. I'm more inclined to believe Rasmus is a generic Russian mobster, opposed to the specific character of Petrov. The closest Jacket even gets to say meeting Petrov, and I use the word meeting very loosely, is that Jacket sees the aftermath of what they did to Jake. Another piece of evidence could be the fact that Petrov has magenta colored eyes and gingerish hair, similar to the Rasmus mask. The whole game was a movie. This theory suggests Hotline Miami 2 and the events in it were just a movie. This theory is made up of things such as the fact that every act is a VHS tape, and it's named after a normal sequence of a movie, for example, climax, intermission, etc. How every death is written off and ignored, you keep ignoring it until you get it right. Remember when we talked about the hard mode being canon theory? Yeah, get used to multiple points being used over and over for different theories in different ways. This would, in this specific theory, explain why Richard knows all this shit. I shit you not, he might be the director. Yeah, I didn't really like this one either. The Colonel is Richter's dad. Colonel being Richter's dad is a theory that is often passed around. Let's see why. Firstly, in Richter's home, there's a room that has a few hunting trophies, such as an animal skin rug and also taxidermied heads. Now, now it's assumed that this room was probably Richter's dad's man cave, or a study of sorts. In the Hawaii missions, we see the colonel having this strange mental breakdown of sorts, in which he is seen wearing a panther's skin over his head. Now killing a wild animal is one feat of its own, but then to perfectly skin its head without damaging the pelt is not something your average Joe would know. That's something a hunter would have knowledge of. If we want to get real tinfoil hat conspiracy theorists, then we can tie this theory back to the beginning of this tier. If the colonel is Richter's father, this could explain Richter's absence in Hawaii. Perhaps in some strange case of nepotism, Richter was moved to a less dangerous post? I don't see it myself, but one could also argue that they look similar. I mean, they're just both older bald guys, but the point still stands. Henchman was a Russian soldier. This theory implies that the henchman is a full-blood Russian, but if he had served under the Russian military in the Hawaii war, he might have gotten a tan that has apparently lasted him six years now. Also, if he had served in the military, that would explain his ability to fight and kill, and even his slightly more professional vibe that he gives off when playing as him. For example, his silenced pistol that he starts off with. It's not a shotgun like Pardo has, or a chainsaw like Alex. He's not there to mutilate or to have fun like most of the characters. He's there to get a job done. I got a similar vibe from Beard in the Hawaii military levels, hence the possible military service. The loaded pistol and final cut was placed by Pardo. So apparently Pardo and Evan can be seen in the final cuts as extras for Midnight Animal. They are meant to be seen right here. I might just be blind. I don't see any sign of Pardo or Evan whatsoever. But as any Pardo related theory ever to exist, Pardo wasn't happy with the attention the mass maniac aka Jacket was getting. I mean, they were making a whole movie on him, no matter how inaccurate it might have been. So this theory suggests that Brown's accidental onset death was no accident, but in fact, the props were tampered by our favorite thick-skinned individual. Martin Brown is not an actor and Midnight Animal is a fantasy. Okay, I found a lot of possible entries for this one. You'd be surprised with how many Hotline Miami theories exist related to Martin Brown. One theory I found related to this is that Martin Brown could be a legit serial killer that has twisted his own actions into being some movie star for a horror flick. Or at the very least, he's someone who has homicidal tendencies, but has made a fantasy of being a movie star that can act out these fantasies through a movie set. Another possible theory that could lead us back to the previous Martin Brown theory is that Martin Brown is some sort of an alter ego to Manny Pardo. If this is the case, it would make sense that Martin Brown is not an actor and Midnight Animal is a literal fantasy of Pardo's. 
The Abyss was Denaton telling fans there won't be a sequel. Alright, here's what I got for this one. If you really, really hyper-analyze this interaction Evan has with the masked individuals, in some strange, deep, cosmological, epistemological, symbolic way, this interaction could be a metaphor for Hotline Miami fans interacting with Denaton games. For example, we can theorize that Evan is meant to symbolize a certain part of the fan base, the truth seekers if you will, the people who are constantly grabbing at any leads they can find, any answers that might explain something. With this being said, what if that interaction between Evan and what seems to be Richard, Don Juan, and George is a metaphor for fans asking Danaton Games for yet another sequel? Here, watch this for yourself and tell me what you think. That last line rang in my ears and is the biggest proof for this one. Don't force us to do something we don't want to. I mean, that's pretty on the nose if I do say so myself. The entire interaction is the masked individuals essentially telling Evan to leave them alone and how they had a deal. This is probably also referencing that one crazed part of the fan base that just wants more and more Hotline Miami games. Tier 4 Tony's mask is from the bomb guy intention plus Tattoo artist is the Tony intention. So I'm going to combine these two entries for this one as they're essentially talking about the same subject. As the name says, Tony's mask, the one from the fans, might be from the guy who gets blown up in the tension level from Hotline Miami. The guy in the room is seen wearing the mask before he gets annihilated. I'd also like to add on that some even speculate that the tattoo guy in Hotline Miami 2 might have been THE Tony. This is because the tattoo shop is named Tony Skate Tattoo and the date for the employment that he gives Jake is the day tension happens. This makes Jake's statement even more ironic and ignorant. Richter wears blue mittens. Richter wearing blue mittens was a joke theory created because of the blue color sprites on Richter's hands. In reality, he's probably wearing some sort of latex gloves. But this theory implies that he's instead wearing blue mittens that his mother knitted for him. Jacket's cell is actually blast proof. This is one of those theories that I personally couldn't find much on. I'm not even sure what this is based off of because it's very clear that Jacket dies due to the nuclear blast. I found some talk of some people speculating that maybe Jacket's cell might have been underground and perhaps because of that he could have survived. I don't buy it but if you do, tell me why. Biker has heterochromia. Heterochromia is a condition which causes an individual, to put it simply, to have different colored eyes. Biker might be one of them. We see that Biker's left eye has a blue color to it, but his right eye when uncovered has a darker, maybe brownish look to it. However, it's also possible that Biker will suffer from hyphema, which is when blood gets collected in the eyes after some sort of physical trauma. To back this up, when we see Biker in the bar of Broken Heroes, his usual blue left eye also has a red tint to it. Hotline Miami 1 was actually Evan's book. This theory suggests that whatever we played through in Hotline Miami 1 could have been us playing through the lens of Evan's book, the one that he's seen working on in Hotline Miami 2. This would explain the certain confusions we see in the Hotline Miami 1 story. For example, Biker vs Jacket. I've always liked to think that Evan is supposed to represent the truth seeker type fan. The Hotline Miami fan who's trying to piece the puzzle together, despite having limited information available. This would explain the fever dream-esque vibe of Hotline Miami 1. The account that will be based off of multiple testimonies, taking bits and pieces from each one to make the story make some sort of sense. Gang members being foreshadowed in Hard News Outro. In the outro of Hard News, Jake goes to get a tattoo of old Dixie on his arm, in which we can see what looks like a bald dude getting tatted up. This could be a Russian mobster. Next to that is a helmet that sort of resembles the Russian mobsters and how they're seen by the sun on his drug rampage. Jake is the smartest character. This entry is born from the fact that when you think about it, Jake really just discovered 50 Blessings entire agenda in like the span of a few weeks. Think about it. Almost all the characters when referring to the events of Hotline Miami are like, Aw oh, dude, it was way too organized. Whoever they were, they wanted something, and they made sure they got it. But almost none of them, besides a very select few, alright, say it or figure it out. Then meanwhile you have Jake, a fairly stupid character who not only figures out their goal, where they're located, and by extension where they operate from. At the end of the day, like many entries, this one is as serious as all VIP guards go to heaven. Pardo is Richter's dad. 
get used to the so-and-so is Richter's dad because we're going to have plenty of those. Yeah, so this one's definitely a troll. The age difference between Pardo and Richter is maximum 10 years. And the only similarity they have is green eyes. Hang up your hats, ladies and gents. We found Richter's father. Yes, yes, I know, I know. It was a long, difficult eight years, but we did. The Van Boss is Jacket's amalgamation of Richter and Biker. As we know, it's generally agreed upon that whatever levels take place before trauma are most likely Jacket reliving the last few months in some strange comatose dream. When we look at the Van Boss, he quite literally looks like Richter and Biker put together, sharing Richter's face and Biker's hair. What if the Van Boss, and how Jacket ends him, was Jacket's way of getting revenge in his head against two people who he would have gone against? Biker for not being able to end him, and then because of that, Richter shooting Jacket and causing him to end up in a coma in the first place. The 50 Blessings headquarters has nuclear proof walls. This one's pretty cool. When you go into the 50 Blessings HQ as Jake, you see a bank like vault. You see a bank like vault door, plus the fact that some of the thickest walls are seen in this area. Basically, this theory implies that Miami getting nuked was in fact a part of 50 Blessings plan, hence the nuclear proof looking HQ. They prepared for this. Unused Demon Enemies This one is most likely referring to the last mission in Hotline Miami 2, where the sun fights Russian mobsters, but to him, they look like demons because he's on some crazy ass drugs. He apparently never took the life lessons seen in Scarface on how to be a great drug dealer. I tried finding some images somewhere of these unused demon enemies, but I couldn't find anything. Oh, and one more thing. I probably should have said this three tiers ago, but if you'd like to add on to any of these entries, feel free to do so. For example, if you have an image for this one, leave a link down below, I'd love to see it. Richter's 50 blessings letter is in his bin. If one pays attention to detail, you can actually see the 50 blessings newsletter paper crumpled up and thrown in Richter's trash can. This adds to the fact that Richter initially thought that these were prank calls until his car got torched and his mother was threatened. Richard is the copy flash guy. This one I don't have much to say for. I just don't see it. I mean, yeah, he's kind of shady looking with his eyes being covered and whatnot, but... I don't see how he could be a former Richard. Even if he was Richard, what would be the point of sending Evan to a rundown decrepit 50 Blessings HQ? To speed up Evan's death by sending him to a place where he could get killed? That's just not who Richard is. I saw some theories that state that the copy flash guy could have been a 50 Blessings agent. And to end Evan's investigation of the events back in 89, he was tasked with sending Evan there for some sort of ambush. And even though I don't buy that theory either, that one holds way more weight than this one. Cocaine Cowboys is canon. Cocaine Cowboys Alongside Drive is a movie that no doubt had a heavy influence on Hotline Miami. This movie is based off of Miami in the 70s and 80s, and the whole fiasco which was that era. I guess this entry is implying that the events of Cocaine Cowboys is canon in the Hotline Miami universe, or at the very least the existence of the movie. Tier 5 Pardo was framed by the real Miami mutilator. This is another one of those theories that it has to be a joke theory. Unfortunately, I couldn't find anything for this, so yeah, moving on. Jacket actually doesn't like hurting people. I want to preface that I'm basically shooting in the dark with most of this tier. I haven't been able to find much information for these ones, so take these with a tablespoon of salt. Most of these also seem to be jokes. For this entry, let's assume that this is referring to a theory that Jacket was forced to carry out the killings in Hotline Miami 1. Jacket is a character that's portrayed as someone who revels in the violence, and that's probably the truth. However, what if he was more like Richter? Hawaii was, well, a war. He, like the others, was defending his country against the Russian invasion. After he came back from the war, he signed up for the 50 Blessings newsletter. Maybe he tried ignoring the messages, but was threatened in ways we don't know about. After that, being left with no choice, he had to go through with it. At least they were mobsters. These aren't the good guys. Jacket is seen showing disgust over killing the bum in the first game, and then after that he saves the hooker, and even nurses her back to health. And this is why. Jacket is actually a metaphor for the medic from Phantom Pain. I'm listening to the man who sold the world, I can't help it. Biker's real name is Charlie. So remember way back in tier 1 we discussed the theory of Jacket's real name being Richard because of the mask and whatnot? This theory follows the same beat. Biker was also given his name by the community because of his bike and the biker helmet he is seen wearing. The theory suggests that the Charlie mask might have been Biker's original mask. And by extension, Charlie is Biker's real name. Some reasons for this are A. The Charlie mask is a melee focus mask. When wearing the Charlie mask, you should be able to find more melee weapons. This fact paired with B, Biker is a melee only character. He can't pick up other melee weapons, let alone guns. Another thing to note is that the Charlie mask also matches Biker's color palette, an almost light neon blue. Everyone is Richter's dad. 
This is a completely serious Hotline Miami fact, not a theory, in which everyone is Richter's dad. The Colonel, Pardo, the Russian grandfather, every being who is either bald or has green eyes is a possible candidate for Rosa Bregg's baby daddy. The son stole Corey's katana. Corey from the fans is seen having a katana in the Hotline Miami comics. As the name implies, the son might have taken that shit from Corey. As we know, the son has this ability in which, just like Corey, he has the ability to dodge roll, but he also starts with a katana. However, it is important to note that the bodyguard ability is most definitely in reference to the bodyguard from Hotline Miami 1, who also might be the son's mother. Daniels is the phone hall manager. Daniels is one of the members of the Ghost Wolf unit alongside Beard. The theory goes that the dude biker killed in the phone hall building is actually Daniels after the war. First off, the resemblance between the two is something to note. Who knows, maybe a few years after the war, he got hit up by 50 blessings and decided to join them, or he could have just been an associate, who knows. Henchman's cat survived. So as we know, Henchman's girl just leaves the guy after he got the literal bag, and Henchman himself tragically passed away, rest in peace, gone up enough for gun. So what happened to his cat? You see, if this was an ordinary cat, it would have just died. However, as we know due to multiple reasons that are completely legitimate, the cat was actually a head director of 60 blessings. Yes, you heard me right, 60, not 50. It is canon that he survived. Dennis and Jonathan started a nuclear war between Russia and America as a ploy for their home country Sweden to take over the world. It's clear that the Hotline Miami games were made as propaganda to stem a real nuclear conflict between Russia and America. This is clearly seen in the fact that conflicts such as Russia and Ukraine only happened after Hotline Miami 1 and 2. Barnes is dead. Barnes is dead. Pardo is Jacket. Pardo has a very similar sprite to Jacket. You know, white guy, blonde hair. Although I do question how people can confuse someone with such thick skin like Pardo with Jacket. All Hotline Miami 2 characters represent aspects of the fanbase. Okay, so I know the last few entries have been straight trolls, but this is actually a good one. As the name suggests, the characters in Hotline Miami 2 represent different parts of the fanbase. For example, the fans are meant to be those people in the fanbase who glorify the violence of Hotline Miami 1. The guys who wanted Hotline Miami 2 to be the exact same as Hotline Miami 1. In every aspect, from story to gameplay. On the other hand, we have someone like Evan Wright. Evan represents the truth seeker, the individual who is constantly trying to make sense of the story with the evidence he has provided. What well, little of it at least. Alright, so I'm gonna save the apocalypse one for last because this is like the last real entry. So let's skip to Cory is barefoot. This entry is in reference to the fact that Cory's sprite looks like she's barefoot. Foot fetish people relax, please. This is due to the fact that the sneakers she's wearing are extremely close to her skin tone. However, Dennis from Downtown Games has confirmed that there are in fact white sneakers that have just gone brownish in color over time. Hard mode is personalized. Hard mode is a version of the game that is known to cost not much except your sanity. It's often critiqued as being unfair or even too hard at times. However, as this entry suggests, hard mode might be personalized to how you play. Meaning if you like peeking with Tony, boom, fuck you. Room filled with dudes with shotguns. Everything in Apocalypse was real. So I'm really surprised to see this all the way down in tier 5 to be honest. I always knew that this was something fairly unknown and obscure, kind of, but I didn't think it would have been placed at tier 5 on this iceberg. Now unless this entry is referring to something else entirely, Apocalypse is the last mission in Hotline Miami 2, in which you play as the sun hallucinating on some hard ass drugs. The mission is an absolute trip to play through. You fight demons and animals that are only ever seen in this mission. At the end of it all, the sun walks onto a rainbow bridge off the building. Again, it's a strange one to play through, and it gets even weirder when you realize that this level is the opposite perspective to level Death Wish. You're meant to be playing the son, who spent the last night stuffing his face with pills and whatnot. All the demons you see are in fact your fellow Russian mobsters. The animals? Turns out they were the fans you slaughtered and injured. Corey, Alex, Ash, Mark, and Tony. Oh, and what about the bridge? Well, the son takes his own life as he walks off the building, never waking up. In fact, the son's outline can be seen by many Pardo when you go to negotiate. Man oh man, ladies and gentlemen, wow this video is finally finished, holy crap man this video took ages, I think two months or one whole month at least to make man 
you know, I have other responsibilities in life, as we all do. School and whatnot, and damn, this, this video is like the longest video I've ever made, man. Not necessarily in time, but overall production, you know. Editing, getting the clips together. This was all necessarily, I guess, I don't want to say my doing, but this was essentially me. And, you know, my editing and all this. Like, I don't have an editor, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is this is just a hobby of mine. And, wow, I can't believe this video is finally done, man. I've been on this video for so long. Listen, if you made it all the way to the end here, thank you so much, man. I, I, appreciate, I appreciate you coming to the end here and, you know, spending, what, 35, 40 minutes on this video, enjoying this video. I appreciate that so much, man. You guys have a blessed day, man. I'll catch you guys next time.